This is Jeffrey Tucker, and it's my great pleasure to be sitting here with John Papala, who is the maker of that now very famous Hayek Keynes video with a million YouTube views or something. And the important thing is not so much the number of views, but where it's been viewed. Um, John, your, your video is in all the classrooms in the world. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me, Jeff. Um, I don't know if it's in all the classrooms in the world, but it is certainly in some. So uh, you talked last night about how many languages it's been tra uh, translated to. Yeah, I, I think it's a, up to 12 and possibly more because I noticed that, for example, a French version was posted on a separate website not on YouTube but on Dailymotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great. The French one, as of right now, has something like 40,000 views. <laughs> how, do, how does it work? Are they rapping in French? No, not yet. What they're <laughs> just doing is putting the subtitles up. Oh, okay. Which yeah. is, it's, it's great because it's... Um, you know, it's a nice voluntary service that yes. the community is providing. When you uh, made this video, did you uh, consider the implications of, of open sourcing it the way you did as versus uh, putting it behind a, a wall, a payment wall or something? Did you think about this aspect of things? I did, you know, uh, in the professional media world, in the, you know, mainstream media world that I, you know, that I find my full-time uh, employment, there's a big question about what, how to interact in this new media space. So, you know, I'm pretty familiar with sort of the questions of how you're going to find an audience in this world, in this online world, and, you know, do you put stuff behind a paywall the way, like, Wall Street Journal does, or do you put it out for free? And the point of this whole video was to drive awareness and education. So to put, to put it behind a paywall really was exactly the opposite of what we were trying to achieve, Russ and I. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it wasn't even a question. It was, we were gonna, this is going to go out for free. And then, the, you know, if it's as successful as we hope it'll be, that'll create opportunities. So in a lot of ways, this is, this is, this is a piece of advertisement. Right. Yeah, it was for the you Austrian know? school and for, yeah. for, that, for important ideas. And people don't charge for ads. Well, I thought it was intriguing when I first saw it because... Um, lots of times on YouTube, you don't see uh, quality original content. You see, you know, some pirated thing or some home video or some guy riding a, his computer as a skateboard and he crashes or whatever, you know. Um, but to see such a high quality thing that was originally posted on YouTube, right? And That's that was right. your strategy from the beginning. Well, I think there was there was a couple reasons to go with YouTube. One was um, scale. So it's there. It's a very familiar interface for people. It's yeah. the dominant platform. So and it has comments and it has embeddability and all those features yeah. and for us to go with something that's a more targeted platform like Bright Cove and some of these video services that basically provide a unique yes right Vimeo is uh, yeah, that, I mean no oh, that's and, and really I awesome. actually recently posted it on Vimeo because okay, Vimeo is good. more yeah. quality yeah. oriented yeah. Yeah. so I liked having yeah. that I see. higher quality uh, option available but right. um, with YouTube it's just quick. You just say go to YouTube. Mm -hmm. It it shows you that hits count that hit counts and yeah. it shows that's sort of just a touch point. It it helps. There's a sort of re positive feedback loop. If, if the YouTube hits keep growing, that attracts more audience. It attracts more media yeah. attention. You know, after one week we had half a million views, yeah. and that in and of itself created atten more attention, which drove right. even more viewership. <laughs> The implausibility of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So you know, so to to have gone with a put it where everybody is approach yeah. on, with something that's so on such a ground, grassroots effort, I think would have been a mistake. It would have dispersed the numbers. Well, I, I consider your distribution method to be ingenious. I mean, it was simple, but it's sometimes hard to come up with a simple solution. You know, like that, especially when you have a treasure like that video really is. You think, well, shouldn't this be on you know broadcast television or something like that? Which may end up being who knows. But. It's um. Yeah, it's, I, I have it, I, I say that I, 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 this is not an idea that I originated, but we live in a new world where getting distributed is not the question, it's getting discovered. Yeah. So discovery is the new distribution, where it used to be the case that, how am I going to get my movie distributed? That's easy, you put it on the internet. How do you, how do you get your movie discovered? How do you get people to find it in an ocean of content? Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, we had a lot of mainstream media help. We had the NPR. Uh, yeah. news story or times and and you know i think that 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 was a leg up on top of the video you know being sort of unique and yeah and of course every australian in the world was all over that thing within a, a matter of minutes can i ask you what has it meant for your own um professional status for your career 
Well, I think, you know, this is, this project's a completely separate line of business, so to speak, from my life in the, you know, professional broadcast world. But to the extent that that professional world is trying to figure out the internet, um, I think that at the very least, anybody with a hit, you know, there's a funny thing, you know, people think that Hollywood, I mean, Hollywood and the media world is, uh, has a bias. And I think that's, you know, that's probably true. I think that is true in some respects. You know, designers think they can design, which leads them to think that they can design more than they can. Right. You know, and Hayek's got a lot of good things to say about the problems of design. And we put that quote at the end of the video. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about how do you get eyeballs? You know, it is actually a capitalist system, this media world. And yeah. so, um, yeah. this, to have a success like this can only help me. Yeah, pay, people pay attention to success. You know, so that's really at the end. I mean, you know, it, I, I'm reminded of not that there's a correlation, but I'm reminded of the Passion of the Christ yeah. film, which, despite all of the controversy about that movie and about the you know undertones in it, Mel Gibson as a personality. The fact of the matter is, after that movie, you had all of these other biblical movies that came out yeah. on TV and film, because. It's a capitalist system. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's true even in the world of, of opera. You know, you can get a singer who's never sung in any of the major operas, but as a big commercial star, uh, eventually the major operas will uh, invite that singer in, and, and he or she will be singing the big parts, you know. Uh, after the, So the, the respectability oftentimes follows the, um, the popular popularity. You know? I mean, uh, that certainly happened with Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, you know his uh, respectability to the extent that he has it definitely followed his popularity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, maybe actually, you know what? Maybe that's not a fair dig. He had a, he had respectability before the general theory. I, but, I thought, but in any event, the, you know, you know, you get my point. I it think. was funny last night in your talk. I, I thought about it this morning. You gave very short shrift to. Um, the difficulties of coming up with the text of the rap itself. I mean, you just said, well, I came up with these rhymes and moved on. But I can tell you watching it the first time, I was amazed at your uh, capacity for reducing the Austrian theory to just its essentials in a way that so could clearly communicate in these rhyming couplets. I mean, that's, 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 in, it was ingenious. And yet, last night, really, I think you just said something like a half sentence on that point. <laughs> um. I don't know. I don't know what to say. It's a, not to pat myself on the back, but for some reason, I'm good at that. <laughs> it's weird. You no, know, my, my wife said it because I, you know, I'm not a rapper, but I will kind of come up with weird songs on the fly. We'll be driving along and I'll sort of improvise a little thing. And, uh, so, it, it, you know, I, I think it's just because of familiarity. You know, I've just got, I've, I got bitten by this Austrian bug, mm -hmm. and so I've I've read I'll read things that provide no new information just because there's always a little color or texture yeah. to some to each person's exposition of these things right. that you pick up something you pick up some terminology or some analogy or some insight, and so I just read like crazy about it, and I think it doesn't really help explain how I came up with the rhymes. Uh, but but you can see the influence in 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 the videos you're watching. You know, if you've been reading this material, you go, "Oh, wow, that was Mises. Oh, there's Hayek's uh, special contribution. Oh, there's Garrison. Oh, this uh, point made by Salerno. You know, so you you yeah. and in in this very small medium, you get a kind of a collapse of like a hundred years of intellectual history. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, you know, we interviewed Russ and I interviewed Larry White. Yeah. Um, in advance of shooting the shooting, we had an opportunity to do so, and we did. And so we played the the song because right. at that point we had the song, and and he listened to the song and read it along. And then he said that he said there's a lot of Garrison in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grasping for resources. Yeah, the grasping for resources. <laughs> he pointed that out. And yeah. he um, and I'm reading. I'm I'm now reading Time at Money, Garrison's yeah. uh, sort of textbook, yeah. which is you know. But, but you handle the turning point. I mean, I've been at day-long seminars where people have debated this whole question of the turning point of the cycle. What causes it? How do you describe it? What's actually going on when everything turns? Uh, for some reason in the video, uh, you made it all very crystal clear, you know, that it's just it's something that definitely has to happen because what you seem to be seeing is not reality. 
and reality reasserts itself. At what particular point and precisely why is is an interesting question, but it's 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 uh, just as interesting as when the, the the person who's on the inebriated high, you know, t- turns to the t- being sick. You know? Well, I know Roger brought up, and he was absolutely correct that we. In, in presenting it as a drinking story, yeah. we're actually co-opting a, criti- a criticism. Yeah. Yeah. When I started to get into this stuff, um, I said, okay, well, this makes so much sense. Who doesn't it make sense to? Because it seems like it makes perfect sense. Right. I mean, it, tra- and I feel like there's a, we have, we're even, we're in at least a bit of a Hayekian moment because this boom and bust so matches the Hayek's, the, the Austrian story. Right. You know, the low interest rates. I mean, there's people like John Taylor who are not Austrians who simply through an empirical review of reality have arrived at Austrian conclusions right. about the role of um, artificially low interest rates in creating bubbles. And that's, beca- that's at the very least, I think we're, we're going to come out of this episode with a, a more Austrian flavor to the mainstream discussion. Well, I mean, even Obama himself, in an interview I read, made reference to the artificial wealth that we, we seem to be more prosperous than we turned out to be. Yeah. He, he makes reference to this. And I think um, as I was digging into these ideas and reading, you know, you know, articles on Mises.org and listening to podcasts, I was like, well, who says, who, who disagrees with this, this basic story about cheap credit creating a boom? Because it seems like it's an obvious, there's a, there's a natural... The me- individual mechanics of the of the Austrian theory, I think, can be overwhelming because you take it together as a story and it's got a lot of moving parts. But that that piece in particular makes so much sense. So I said, okay, well, let's find who doesn't. And I came across that 1998 article that Paul Krugman wrote in which yeah. he called it the Hangover Theory, right. and complete. And, and I think, you know, he completely glossed over the nature of the cap, the structure of capital. That right. that there's that during he just called it. I th- and I think that my understanding is that this is a pretty common straw man attack on the Austrian theory. Yeah, it goes way back. That it's an overinvestment theory. That's that, right. What's so bad about having more, quote, capital? Right. Now we've got more capital so we can be more productive. But right. if you've made a lot of cars and people don't want any more cars, that capital's not worth anything. Mm-hmm. Hence the line, now it's devalued capital that makes up the slack. Yeah, that was a great line. I so that. that was a direct. That line is a direct answer to the to those like Cr- Paul Krugman and Brad DeLong and other Keynesians who have what seems to be a sort of superficial understanding of what what yeah. the Austrian theory is saying. That it's not just which capital. Capital's not K. It's not a capital stock. We have specific factories that make specific things, yeah. and the factories that went into. Um, producing caterpillar equipment for housing construction aren't worth as much anymore. It doesn't matter that they're lying there uh, un- underutilized now. We don't need any more houses. We're not going to utilize them. Right. That's devalued capital. You know, John, I'm just sitting here wishing that your video had been around in the 1930s and 1940s. You could have avoided <laughs> a lot of problems, you know, because it does answer um, issues that came up between uh, uh, the debates over Lord Robbins's book and Hobbler struggled with these issues in the 1940s. You know, I think you have something. That, that you could have taught these gentlemen something about the Austrian encyclopedia. Let me ask you um, some personal issues. Um, how old are you? I am 32. 32. And did you ever study economics in college? No. And how long have you been interested in economics? I I've always been politically minded. Mm-hmm. Um, I started off as you know, I was raised in a conservative family, and so you sort of, you, you, as a young person, more or less, depending whether you're uh, rebellious or not, either adopt or reject the politi- politics of your parents. Yeah. So my dad, a, sort of like a populist, conservative, you know, pretty libertarian, but not a libertarian, not a not self-proclaiming, systematic. not like, yeah. okay... Right. But you could call him like a minarchist libertarian, like yeah. get the government out of everything except defense. Right. And um, and uh, I always had an issue, uh, an interest in politics and all this stuff. A lot of it was just sort of the enjoyment of argument. Argument. I like the debate. Mm-hmm. It's fun. But when you become a parent, it changes the way you care about these things a lot. Sure. You know, suddenly, you, you know, you have a mortgage, you have a family, 
you're trying to make it in the world, you've lost your job in a downturn as I did during 2001's downturn. And these issues have a visceral impact now and you want to know, you want to understand. If, if, if only to understand, but ideally to help you prepare and to help you see the signs of problems. And I was fortunate in that I, even though, even though I hadn't yet dug into the Austrian, um, story yet, the boom was bizarre. And at the peak of it, you know, we had an apartment in Hoboken and at the peak of it, our neighbors sold their apartment for dramatically more than they, than, than we bought ours for only a year later. I was like, there's no way that this can make any sense that, and maybe I was resting on like the labor theory of value a little bit in thinking that, but it's like it couldn't have gone up in value that much. Like it doesn't make any sense. Nothing's changed. Yeah. Not in this amount of time. It's not like suddenly everything's so much, I don't know. It just felt wrong. So when everything turned, you know, and this is 2007, um, the only one talking about this stuff was Ron Paul. And at this point I'd already been exposed to liber- some libertarian thinking and was beginning to move in that direction thanks to you know, John Stossel's books and some other things I had read. So Ron Paul was the one that turned me on to the Austrian, yeah. the Austrian perspective. Yeah. And once I got turned on to that and started reading and, and following and then Bear Stearns seemed like a full blown sham, a bunch of really, I mean, bailing out the creditors, creating weird subsidiary companies of the Fed that did it. And JP Moore, that whole thing is so, you know, I allege that it's corrupt. Is it corrupt? Who knows? But I, it sure appears to be a flim-flam operation. Okay. And that just, it just continued to confirm what Ron was talking about at a period where he was just being trashed by everybody left and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, I have to, it's a credit to the speed at which your synapses fire in your brain or your <laughs> natural intelligence or your curiosity or something to have processed all this information so quickly over the course of two years and been able to produce what you produce. And I think... But in some ways, you're already legendary, <laughs> and um, this video is uh, immortal. You, so. you praise too much, Jeff. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth. And it's a pleasure to have you uh, at the Scholars Conference and to sit here with you today. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. And um, I definitely, I'm a big fan of everything that the Mises Institute and that you've done with the site. And it's a, the video couldn't have been what it is without the knowledge I gained from the resources you provided to for free. So thank you for that. It's a good partnership. Thank you, John. Yeah.